are. Conversion is a spiritual thing, not a birthright. The gospel of Jesus Christ is meat and substance during famine. It is comfort during pain. It is saving truth when lies and falsehood are in power. Yes, we live in a fearful age, but the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. These are rapidly becoming dangerous days. Wouldn't you agree? It's been said recently, even on our so, you know, national news, but even they have referred to recently the, the, the threat of World War III. To me, to, to even discuss such a term is, or is to suggest it, and I, I think that's unwise in my opinion, but in reality, we can see why. It would take very little to push the world over the edge. We are very close to the same conditions that existed before World War I and World War II. And so, yes, we are rapidly moving into dangerous days. We are losing our freedom of speech in the, quote, free nations of the world. Taxation may be, I, I believe, may even be higher now than it was uh, when the Revolutionary War took place and the Boston Tea Party uh, threw the tea into the uh, canal. And so we are at a place of almost not turning back. It is a very dangerous time. We have the United Nations who feels like they have the right to decide what you do with your children here in the good old USA. Uh, we are rapidly, as Lori and I were discussing yesterday, preparing for the entrance of the Antichrist. Um, dangerous times. Many can easily make the case that our world has moved from con concerning to troubling to perilous in just a few decades when the church finds itself having to travel through fiery trials. It's tempting for us to think that Christians nor the world have ever had to endure similar hardships. We all in every generation think our situation is the worst situation. We think our days are the darkest days. We always look back to the good old days, don't we? Uh, because we know how much better it was back then. You know, it, I look back to the good old days when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s when the Soviet Union was threatening to blow us away off the face of the earth uh, with nuclear warheads. Now, nah, it wasn't any better than it is today, is it? Every generation has its own fears to face, its own realities that are hard to accept. But when we succumb to this kind of fear and self-pity, we're wrong. Throughout the centuries, the Church of Christ has suffered greatly. So much is the case that it might be arguable that the word martyr and Christian are nearly synonymous in the book of Revelation. When the martyrs, or uh, in the book of Revelation, the Bible says, are under the throne, and they cry, How long, O Lord, how long will you not judge? There is a real a reality at which those martyrs represent Christians from all time. And they are under his throne, not as a prison, but as a metaphor. They are under his throne in that, yes, the world took their lives, but now they are precious to God. They are at his throne. The world can no longer reach the Christian and persecute the Christian. But the Bible says in the book of Revelation, where this synonymous, almost synonymous idea is, it says that they overcame by the word of their testimony, that is, their faith and adherence to the gospel. 
when the Bible says the word of their testimony, it doesn't mean like you've seen and I've seen testimony services where we get up and tell about, you know, what happened or how God blessed us or whatever. There's a time and a place for that. But in the book of Revelation, it says they overcame by the word of their testimony. What it means is that they stood firmly on the gospel of Jesus Christ in, in the face of, of death and persecution. They also stood, he says, through, by the blood of the Lamb, which is Jesus' victory on the, on the church's behalf on the cross. And then also, they loved not their lives unto the death. That is, they cherished Christ more than their own lives. So when we put these three pieces together, where we see hundreds of possibly millions of Christians who have been martyred throughout the centuries, and especially in those latter days, and now they're, they're pictured here in the book of Revelation as under the throne of God, and giving testimony of how they survived. They survived by the word of their testimony, by the blood of the Lamb, and by, and that, by not loving their lives unto the death. So we put those three together, and we see that in the fires of, tes of, of testing, and the fires of persecution, martyrdom, arrest, and personal property seizure, and so many other facets of persecution, the Christians have overcome and did overcome in the book of Revelation through holding fast to their profession of faith in Jesus Christ, trusting that his death upon the cross, the shedding of his blood, was sufficient of a transaction before God Almighty and for eternity that they could entrust their, that more valuable than their own lives. Amen. That is the story that changes the world. That is the story that shifted all things. It is the, the message, and I will use the word story here. I want you to understand I'm using it in the philosophical, theological, technical way. I'm not referring to a storybook. I'm referring to a narrative, a historical narrative. Every world, every society, every philosophy, Every civilization has a narrative. They tell a story upon which all of their culture and belief systems, even their practices and holidays, have grown out from. In the ancient Rome, we wouldn't see that as the Roman mythology, which was based on the Greek mythology. But we would say this, that all of those are man-made. The one we're seeing here is of God's doings and was promised at the very beginning. In Mark, we see that we embark on this new study of the gospel according to Mark. I want to encourage you to recognize it as another example of how the Christians were strengthened during a time of great hardship and persecution by refreshing their hearts in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, well, how is that possible? Well, most conservative scholars agree that the gospel of Mark has some very distinguishing features that would help us uh, locate when it was written. And, it, and that is pretty much after 64 A.D. Now, the significance of 64 A.D. is what was called the Great Fire of Rome. Nero was the emperor, and if you know a little bit about history, you know that Nero, at the very beginning of his reign, first couple of years, he was promising. And then he went crazy. And he began to do so many uh, diabolical and debase things that even the Romans began to hate him. They wanted rid of him as their emperor. They were tired of him. And there's every reason to believe that this fire that burned 
There were 14 districts in the city, the great city of Rome. There were 14 districts. Ten of them were destroyed. Some burned completely to the ground by this fire. That's the way this fire worked. It was so bad. And there is great evidence that Nero himself had the fire started. And I personally, as I've studied it, my contention is he started it because he didn't like it. He wanted, he wanted to build nice, you know, all these beautiful edifices and, and, and replace what he considered to be ugly or, or such. I think he, you know, he was just had lost his mind. And when that whole thing backfired on him and the people of Rome were, in, excuse the pun, infuriated at him, he began to try to look for a way out. And so here you have this up-and-coming religious group, the Christians. They are growing and multiplying daily. They literally are becoming a threat to the pagan Rome. And so Nero blames the Christians. He says the Christians set fire to Rome. And so he began to round up these Christians. He put them in prison. He nailed them to crosses. He hung some on poles along the city streets and put pitch all, around, all over them and at night set them on fire to, to light the pathways, the streets of Rome. This is a persecution the likes that few had ever seen. And Christians were thrown, and don't let the History Channel or anybody else lie to you, Christians were thrown into a ring with wild animals, lions, tigers, bear, whatever they had available, were thrown into the ring and watched as entertainment as they fought for their lives to the death and were killed and maimed by these wild animals. But even that backfired as the Roman citizens really knew that Nero was to blame. So when they watched Christians being murdered in such heinous ways, they began to feel sorry for the Christians and they mourned over them, which as you can imagine, didn't do anything but spread Christianity more and more so that one of the early church fathers said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So in other words, the more, peop more Christians they kill, the more Christians there are because uh, this was the way God was blessing his church. This is the context at which Mark, who was a, a member, we might say, of the church at Rome. He was there. And Mark's mentor was the apostle Peter. And Peter himself was arrested and crucified during Nero's persecution. Tradition says he was crucified upside down because he refused to be crucified in the same way that his Lord was. We don't know for sure, but we do know this. Nero murdered the apostle Peter. So you can imagine that here's the church undergoing such fiery trials and persecutions. Even the apostle himself is dying. Church leaders are being thrown into the, the ring and eaten alive by beasts or nailed to a, a wooden post and set afire each night uh, to light the streets. What would you be doing as a Christian if that started happening? You'd be pretty disillusioned, wouldn't you? Well, it's in that context that Mark, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, undertakes to write the Gospel of Mark. And, and it seems that Mark was trying to take the Christians back. He was trying to help them to go back, just as it says in Revelation, to hold to the word of their testimony, to hold to the blood of Christ shed upon the cross, 
and to love not their life until the death. That the gospel is worth it. That Christ is who he said he is. And this is why he opens it in such a way. Far from being pie in the sky, the gospel of Jesus Christ is meat and substance during famine. It is comfort during pain. It is saving truth when lies and falsehood are in power. It is reconciliation with God as Father when the rest of the world will only know Him as judge. Yes, we live in a fearful age, but the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. That's the message of Mark, I believe. So as we look in these first eight verses, we see that the gospel is good news to a troubled world. We see this in the first three verses, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Yes, he was in a literal wilderness, but he was also in the wilderness of sinful man and rebellion against God. And what was his message? Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. This is referring to John the Baptist. The gospel is good news to a troubled world. The word for gospel here is the Greek word euangelion. It may also be translated good news. The gospel is good news. I feel like sometimes that we've heard that, the gospel is good news. But hopefully you've heard this said before. The gospel is only good news when we realize that it comes out into a world that's filled with bad news. When we say the world is fine and we bury our head in the sand and we say that man is going to achieve his own eternal life, that science is going to deliver us all, that we're really not bad people, but at heart we're all good, we just need the right circumstances, enough money for education and so forth, then we'll all be fine. Then the gospel's not really good news in that context. But when we look at the world with reality, and we see it as he does right here, he sets it firmly in the plan of God, as we ended last week in our message, the plan of God. Then we realize that man is not okay, that man is in rebellion against God, that man fell from re relationship with God in the Garden of Eden and has been under the curse ever since. That every time God has revealed himself to man, man has only built for himself more idols. He's only ele elevated himself more and more. If the Tower of Babel were anything, it was a monument to man. Just like our modern civilization has become a monument to the worship of ourselves. This gospel is good news. And this is what Mark is calling them back to. It was not a new word, though. See, we have this tendency to think that the gospel is uniquely a Christian word. Or that the, the word good news is a uniquely Christian word. The Greek word euangelion. But that's not the case. This was a very common word. The Roman world was very familiar with it. It was commonly used to refer to a national holiday that celebrated the ascension of the emperor. So the emperor, on the day that he ascended, was made a holiday in Rome. And this was a celebration word. So each year in the Roman calendar, it was a holiday to celebrate when the Roman emperor had taken his throne. And what did they do? They went, uh, went about and celebrating the euangelion. The good news that the emperor reigns. You see where this is going? 
I don't know, Pete and I didn't talk about this, but as I looked at his choice of songs, I thought, he's reading my mind. You know, the songs we sang this morning are, un are intimately related to this text. Now, he probably did that on purpose because he, he knows the book of Mark. But we actually didn't talk about that. I mean, he just, you know, Pete understands what good music and he understands the scriptures. And, you know, so I, I trust that. And, but I witness it and I want to give God the glory and for, for that. But it was commonly used. So when Jesus and his apostles began to use this word to refer to the first coming of Jesus, the message was clear that Jesus is the long-awaited king, the Messiah for which the Jews had long looked since the, bringing, uh, the, I'm sorry, the beginning of time. So you see, when, when Jesus came to speak the gospel, when the, the good news, that is set in the context of this ascension of the emperor. So what are we saying? We're saying the real king has shown up. William Hendrickson, the great commentator, he said this. One of the themes of the book of Mark is that, that Jesus as the king is moving rapidly and accomplishing great things that eventually he purchases our salvation. You're going to see that he's right about that. As we look in the first chapter, I don't know, I didn't count, but I believe it's maybe five or six times he uses the word, and immediately, and immediately, and immediately. Well, if you know the other Gospels, you realize these things didn't happen exactly immediately. So Mark's not changing the story. Mark is speeding up the story. And he's, why? Why? Because Mark, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wants you and me and his readers to understand that, that although the Roman Empire looks like it's about to stamp out the Christian faith, the mighty king has, ar has, has arrived and he is moving and he's moving fast and he's accomplish accomplishing things. He has purchased redemption and he's greater than the emperor. He's greater than the emperor. The good news, the beginning the gospel of, Je of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's almost mocking the emperor who called himself the Son of God. It's almost flying in the face as a Christian, like he's, some would say today who, you know, it's, well, don't get, don't get political, preacher. Well, you might want to tell that to Mark. You might want to tell that to John the Baptist and so many others. Because this reads the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, almost like an inscription that begins to announce the emperor of Rome. And I submit to you, it's meant to. Nothing's by accident in God's word. See, for a believer during that time, it looked like the emperor of Rome held the church in the, in the palm of his hand, and could crush it at any time. But Mark says, that's not true. Remember at the beginning, that Jesus Christ is the anointed one, and he's the real Son of God. No, you're in his hand, and his hand is in the Father's hand. God's in control, not the emperor. This idea of beginning is linked closely to, you've seen it before, you probably just haven't connected it. John, and John in his gospel, he says, in the beginning. And he uses the creation account to launch into what we might call the new creation account. And that is when the Son of God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, who goes on to prove that He's the Messiah and purchases our redemption, at which time when we believe we are born again, new creations, and we enter the kingdom of God. This is called new creation theology. And this is exactly what Mark is saying. He's not just saying, 
Oh, I remember back in the good old days at the beginning. That's not what he's saying. He's saying at the beginning. When God reached over and grabbed the gears of time and ripped them into the way he wanted them to go and said, it's time for my son to be here and be the son of God. God entered in to the situation and changed the narrative. These words, the gospel beginning, Jesus, the anointed one, the son of God. These are words that are earth shattering, earth shaking. They change everything. We should never read so quickly over them and not realize what Mark is saying. The word beginning is used much like it's used in John's gospel, as we said. And it's that kind of good news. Good news! This evil, dark world may be crushing us underfoot, but the king is here, and he's working fast, and he's changing all things. Don't lose heart. Why is it good news? It's good, good news not because a new emperor has ascended the throne of Rome, but because the Almighty God has finally sent His Son, Jesus, to be the Christ, the Anointed One. So the gospel is good news to a troubled world. John's appearance was the sign of an epic change. We're, kind of, we're still on this narrative shift, shift that we've mentioned. Why John the Baptist? Look at verse 4 and 8, 4 through 8. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all the Jerusalem were, ma- were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt about his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes one who's mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It should be noted that that each of the four Gospels speak of the ministry of John the Baptist. What you may ask is the significance of this. I mean... If we're talking about Jesus Christ, the beginning of the gospel, it almost seems like we go on a side note and talk about John for a few minutes and then come back to Jesus. And that's a, that's a tragedy, really. In our modern understanding of the ministry of John, we have placed him as a side note, an ornament, as almost unnecessary. But this cannot be accurate. What, all, what, what for all accounts we give so much space to give a record of John the Baptist? Why would the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, why would they give so much time to John the Baptist when he's rarely part of our Advent celebration or our Christian you know, Christmas um, thought process? We leave him right out, don't we? He's rarely a part of our gospel presentation, isn't he? We have this tendency to jump right to the, the gospel, as, we, as it were. And yet John wants, to, wants us to start, I'm sorry, Mark wants us to start with John. Well, the reason for this is that we have oversimplified the gospel narrative to which we have de- deemed the, quote, essentials because of our belief that all that is necessary for a person to be saved is for them to give assent to the absolute basics of the Christian message. But when Mark, the shortest gospel account in the New Testament, gives us his inspired, abbreviated narrative of the gospel, it begins with the John the Baptist ministry. See, we have, in our day, we have unwisely, sought to see people saved. I think we've done it maybe with good motives, but we, we want to make the gospel simple as if the gospel was something we only mentally need to agree to. So we make it very simple. I was taught this in seminary. 
You know, don't, you know, make it, make it as simple as possible. Keep it simple, preacher. But the gospel of God is supernatural. It's not something that I or any other preacher have the authority or the right to boil down to its basics. It's not my job or place to say, well, we can brush all this information away and all you need to do is believe in these three things or these four things. When the Gospels, all four of which, tells us the life of Christ and presents Christ and includes John the Baptist. Now, I'm not saying believing uh, the mess or the... the uh, uh, who John the Baptist is or what he said is one of the things that helps us to become a Christian. What I'm saying is we don't understand the gospel because we have cut out so many pieces of it thinking we're doing God a favor. Maybe one of the reasons the gospel is no longer epic and changing people on this kind of uh, scale that it once did is that we're not presenting it as an epic change. We are presenting it as Jesus is your, what? Personal Savior. You got your personal cell phone. You might be like some people. You got your personal bottle of, uh, was it Perel? You can get your... You got your personal mask. You got your personal Savior. Jesus will have none of that. He's the Savior. The Savior. Whether I want Him, believe in Him, repent and worship Him, or not, He is the Savior. He's not mine, but I'm His. He's Lord. You see how it's, the shift changes? When we have reduced the gospel down to what you need to make yourself uh, be successful and right with God, who's at the center of that? Me. Who's at the center of the gospels? Christ. Watch out. Satan is a master magician. He will sleight of hand us and we won't even realize what he's done to us. John the Baptist is included here because he marks the transition. He's the prophet. The reason for this is that John was prophesied. Mark tells us that John's appearance was a sign of the Messiah. If we were looking at the Old Testament prophecies, expecting God to do what he had always promised he would do for thousands of years. Want to know why John starts off in the second verse saying, as Isaiah the prophet said, and he actually quotes three passages and merges them together, one of which comes from Isaiah, but he quotes these three together so that we understand the, the, the sovereign plan of God for the ages to save souls through his own son, Mark starts it in the very second verse. Why? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ, the coming of Jesus Christ, has to be contextualized and, and seen as a fulfillment of God's divine promise. This is not man's narrative. This is God's narrative. God's, all the things that man has made up throughout the centuries, their mythologies and their religions, are their ways of of shifting things to suit themselves. The Tower of Babel is a good example of one. But here's the case where God has said from the very beginning, the woman, the seed of the woman, will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. And the prophets appeared and said, it's coming. 
It's coming. It's coming. Thousand years. Thousand years. Thousand years. It's coming. It's coming. Thousand years. Thousand years. Then 300 years of silence. So much so that the rabbis themselves, during that time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, said, the work of the prophets is over. It's been 300 years since we have heard from a prophet. The, the work of prophets are over. What was the work of the prophets? To call them to repentance, to look for the salvation of God. 300 years of silence. The prophets are finished. And stepping into the wilderness, both literally and figuratively, appears a voice. Not a man, a voice. Crying in the wilderness. Repent. Make your way right. Get your life right with God. Because there's one coming who's much greater than I am. And remember, the crowds, it says all of Jerusalem, all of Judea were going out to hear him. It's clear that John was going up and, up and around the Jordan preaching. And thousands and thousands of people were going to hear him. And this man says to them, there's somebody coming who's much greater than me. He's the voice crying in the wilderness, which is the exact words that were used by the prophets in the Old Testament that God would send a messenger crying in the wilderness about the Messiah coming. For generations, the Jewish people had celebrated Passover at the table they would put with their family an empty place setting. And who was that place setting for? The prophet Elijah. And who was, and, and what was Elijah's place? Why was it so special? Why was it at the Passover meal? Why did they expect Elijah to return? Because he was to be the, announcing, the announcer of the coming Messiah. When Elijah appeared again, then you knew that the Messiah was coming within his lifetime. Now, pause that for a second. Why did John the Baptist wear such weird clothing and eat such weird things? Now, understand this. The Bible's not saying he ate nothing else. I mean, he may have eaten biscuits and gravy. I don't know. But... But apparently he spent a lot of time in the wilderness. And out there, of course, there were locusts and wild honey. Uh, this was wilderness apparel. It was also not fine apparel. This was the, uh, the apparel of poor people. Camel's hair. Not something the ladies in Jerusalem were running out to get. <laughs> you know. So John the Baptist is wearing this poor man's uh, clothing, camel's hair, with just a basic leather belt around. He's eating things like somebody that, that's a, almost a wild man. He's living out in, the, out in this wilderness area, and he's eating off the land, this honey and locusts. You say, well, why does the Bible put that in there? Because the point is, this is meant for you and I, to reckon, reckon in our minds that this was very similar to the way the prophet Elijah was described in the Old Testament. Mark wanted us to understand John the Baptist is Elijah. Not reincarnate, fulfilling the role of the prophet. In fact, Jesus himself said, if you will have it, John the Baptist is Elijah. So in other words, if you see the plan of God, if you're willing to repent to make his way straight, if you're willing to prepare your own heart, you'll see John the Baptist was, was Elijah. He was announcing my coming. 
So we see John appeared at the proper time, that his practice was pointed toward the Jews. When John says, uh, make his path straight and to repent or be converted and was baptizing people in the Jordan River. Let me contextualize that for you just a, a little bit. Baptism was not new. The Jewish society, the Jewish religion in the Old Testament had lots of washings and, and what they called baptisms, some of which was the whole body, uh, which was done in the lathe, uh, uh, the, the copper uh, bowl, as it were. The high priest would get in that and would be, uh, would be washed. Others might be just their hands and so forth. There's all kinds of washings or baptisms, ceremonial baptisms and washings. So the fact that John the Baptist is baptizing people is not strange. That's very normal. Uh, when people, But there's two things that are strange about it. One is that it's marked by repentance, which is still kind of not all that odd, but he's calling them to repentance. But when you understand repentance here means not just turning from sin, but a turning away from idolatry, a turning to God and his kingdom and his son. Conversion, we might say today. Well, that, that kind of baptism was not given to Jews. It was only given to proselytes. If you were a Gentile and you wanted to become a follower of the Jewish God, Yahweh, in the Old Testament, you were baptized with this kind of baptism. But if you were born a Jew and circumcised as a male or you know, brought into a covenant family in the Jewish community, you weren't baptized like this. So John the Baptist is speaking to Jews who are coming out uh, of Jerusalem and Judea who have never been baptized like this because they were born Jewish. They didn't need to convert to the true God. Or did they? And see, John the Baptist is saying to them, you're a sinner, just like the pagans, just like the Gentiles. Repent and be baptized. Be converted to the true God. Give Him your heart. Make His, make his path straight. Where? In your heart. In your heart. Conversion is a spiritual thing, not a birthright. And so John is calling them to true conversion. And he pointed everyone to the promised one. Notice that he's a voice crying in the wilderness. Not so much a man. They came to John and they said, listen, more people are going to hear Jesus than you. In other words, aren't you jealous? And John says, he must increase and I must decrease. John knew his place. His place was by the side of the king, pointing people. And when Jesus crossed his path, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Well, he said, Here, one is coming, and I'm not even worthy to be a slave who would unlatch his shoe and wash the dirt from his feet. And who is that one? Well, as Jesus goes by, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's that man. And Jesus comes to be baptized, and he says, I need to be baptized by you. Why? Because I am part of the sinful Jewish community that needs to repent and believe in the true God. Jesus himself said, if you will have it, John was Elijah. Then lastly, and quickly, as King Jesus coming, as King Jesus coming began a new age. It began a new age. Not the new age movement, but God's new age. This new creation theology that I mentioned earlier. And you see that at the end. I will baptize you, John says, with water. That is the sign of conversion outwardly. You say you repent. 
You say that you're going to follow the true God and his kingdom. I'll baptize you. But John's ministry can only go so far. All he can do is accept your confession and dunk your body. But there's one coming after me, he says. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? In other words, he'll wash your sins away, not from your body, but from your heart. He will create you new on the inside out, not as the Old Testament from the outside in. An epic change. God had finally fulfilled his promise to provide a lamb for himself as he promised Abraham when Abraham pulled Isaac from the altar. In essence, God said, Abraham, don't sacrifice your son. I'm going to sacrifice mine so that you and all who believe in him might be forgiven, saved, and entering in to a new kingdom. People, Christians of Rome, who are undergoing such terrible times, take heart. This is a dying kingdom. Has the message of Jesus coming become routine to you? Are the troubles of this current world crisis causing you great fear? Mark, the writer of the blessed gospel, speaks to you and me today. He says to go back to the good news. God has sent His Son to be the Savior. What you are witnessing, what I am witnessing, is the death of the old world and the birth pangs of the new. Be encouraged. Jesus Christ has come. Do you know Him? Have you been converted? Have you turned from your sins and believed in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom God sent to save your soul? If not, believe today and he will hear you that's right hey guys thanks for tuning in to our latest video go ahead and click that little thumb so you can like that video as well as on the bottom right hand corner click that little bell to subscribe and receive notifications thank you again so much for tuning in supporting our video ministry here at Cognitive Church